truth, love, and the good. Here we go. Welcome to the DT PhD podcast. I'm David Tian, PhD, your host, and I'm joined um, by my guest, Henry Chung. Hello. Hey, Henry. There is a storm going on in Hong Kong. Yes, it <laughs> so is. So it's uh, just a started super recently. Super typhoon. Uh, yeah, like late, late in the middle of last night, actually. I can just look out the windows now. I uh, just got upgraded to Typhoon 10. Uh, it's not that, it's actually not that close to, to Hong Kong, but I think it went right over the Philippines and it's going to go right over South and China. So we'll see. You'll probably hear a lot of background noise. Yeah, it was a pretty big deal. I have uh, some team members out in the Philippines and it took out their internet for a while. Yes. So, so if um, I suddenly disappear, up, you'll know away. why. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and if you hear lots of wind uh, in the background, that is what's happening, and it will just actually intensify over the next few hours. So, yep. um, so there's no getting around it, but uh, I appreciate your dedication, Henry, for being on. Yes. And uh, so if, if this is the first time you're listening to this, um, I have been for over the past 12 years helping hundreds of thousands of people in over 87 countries attain success, happiness, and fulfillment in life and love. And Henry, how about you introduce yourself quickly? Yes, well, my name is Henry Chong, and I am the CEO of the Fusan Group. Uh, we are, I guess today, a broadly diversified financial services group. We've got arms helping families do investment management, giving them peace of mind, knowing that their assets are safe across the generations. But we're also undergoing a number of uh, fintech projects, including in the blockchain space, which is some of the more exciting stuff I'm working on now. But here, I always enjoy coming and having conversations with you, David, about life, love, wealth, and happiness, and many other things besides. So I think today is heuristics that we're going to go talk about. Yes. So great topic. It's one that we've been thinking about discussing for a while. So we're finally getting around to it. And Henry, why don't you start us off on just introducing the concept and why it's important? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, following on from our last podcast, Uh, I actually thought it would be very interesting to talk about heuristics. You know, we were talking about uh, things like resilience and anti-fragility. And I think heuristics are really interesting in trying to actually apply some of that. Now, when I say heuristics, I mean uh, as opposed to, say, algorithmic decision-making. So an algorithm is a pre-programmed set of rules. Um, We're probably all familiar with the term because computers use this to make decisions or to run code or programs. And there are some cases when having an algorithm as a human may work, right? Here's a formula, here's a set of rules, follow it. Um, Perhaps, for example, I'll talk more about this later, but let's say we're trying to build a bridge. There are very specific rules and laws that you need to follow to make sure your bridge doesn't fall down. You want to make very specific calculations Uh, Right now, in a super typhoon like in Hong Kong, the way in which you construct certain buildings, you want to make sure that they are, uh, you know, tolerant to winds and you can calculate the fault loads on these buildings. But a heuristic is what you call a rule of thumb. So where it's not a, a specific calculation, it is just some kind of broad based rule. And I believe that especially for human decision-making, these broad-based rules actually can not, they're not only easier to execute, but in many cases actually result in better outcomes. So let me give you a very simple example. For a very long time, people have been trying to program robots to do motion tracking. So a very simple thing is in baseball, uh, you know, someone hits a baseball and you're trying to get a robot to run and catch the ball. Now, to do so with an algorithm is very, very, very difficult, right? I need to calculate a huge number of variables, the flight trajectory of the ball, wind interference, uh, and to try and calculate exactly where that ball is going to end up and have the robot go to that spot and catch it is a non-trivial task. Or I can just program the robot to be like a person. So people, when they're trying to catch a, a baseball, They don't calculate the flight trajectory of the baseball and figure out where to run to. All a human does is follow a very simple rule. Keep your eye on the ball, start running. And if the ball stays in roughly the same fixed place relative to your vision, you're on track, right? If you're running further than the ball, the ball will drift backwards. If you're running ahead, you know, if if the ball is ahead of you, the ball will drift forwards. 
And as long as you can keep a fixed gaze on the ball as you run, as you run all the way forward, you will naturally hit the spot at which the ball is going to land anyway. Now, whether or not baseball catchers realize it, this is what they do. Uh, likewise, airline pilots are trained that if um, you want to figure out when you're flying, if you're going to crash into something like another plane, all you need to do is look at that plane in your windshield and fix a point. And if the plane is moving you know, left or right of that point, it means that you're not going straight towards it. If you're looking at a plane in your windshield and it doesn't move left or right and it's just getting bigger, that means you're going to crash into it. Right? And these very, very simple rules let you perform what is mathematically very complex calculations right? with, with these so-called dumb heuristics. And yet they work very, very well. So those are really basic examples of heuristics. But let me, let me give you some examples of um, situations that are seemingly complex, but where the application of basic heuristics actually has led to very um, you know, good outcomes, I suppose. Uh, one, is, one, one famous example is in um, emergency rooms where uh, doctors, for example, you know, someone comes in and you're trying to figure out whether or not they are having a heart attack. Now, again, there are algorithmic ways of trying to figure this out. I can measure blood pressure. I can look at vital signs. I can do all kinds of calculations. Or there's a, there's a checklist that doctors go through, right? The famous, like, does your arm hurt, etc. Uh, and by following these checklists with a very high probability rate, I can determine whether or not someone is having a heart attack. Uh, likewise, doctors do the same thing when a baby is born, right? They go through a, a checklist, so to speak, to figure out if that baby is healthy or not. Um, you know, and famously, one of those points is whether or not the baby's crying, right? If the baby's not crying, that is a very bad sign, right? Whether or not a baby cries when it is born is, a, is statistically, right, a bigger sign of whether it's healthy or not than trying to measure a whole bunch of vital signs. And so even in these high, I would say especially in high pressure, high context environments, heuristics are very, very helpful because you do not have the time you need to go and do a bunch of calculations and gather a bunch of data. And also human beings under pressure, right, are not always the best at thinking algorithmically versus they found that when they give doctors just a checklist and you say, just follow the checklist, the same for airline pilots, right? Just follow the checklist. Actually, you can result in very, very good outcomes. So, but I don't know if you've come across these kind of things, David. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, the pilot example is really great uh, because there's actually a lot of research that shows, or actually in, in reporting, that's shown um, pilots are chronically overworked. Mm -hmm. So if they're required to use their creative thinking on a regular basis, uh, considering how they're overworked they are, uh, we're all in trouble. So. <laughs> Um, in addition to autopilot backup systems, which in a way, which actually run on um, a kind of heuristic uh, basis as well, uh, you, you know, it would, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But it also works in uh, business. So as you were talking, I was thinking a lot of uh, what I've been reading about uh, in terms of the, uh, encouraging the individual to be creative and empowering the individual to find a personal transformation. When it comes to a system, it's actually detrimental to count on any of your team members having to exercise original thinking. I mean, it's great <laughs> if they do, obviously. And if you have team members who are that talented, um, by all means, you know, we want to give them the creative freedom. But a business that's well run is one that can be run by monkeys. <laughs> it's because you have a system in place that has a lot of room for error. And um, in terms of these checklists and uh, SOPs, um, that you can just follow the book, so to speak, mm -hmm. and you'd be fine. So you have yeah. all of these things in place so that when someone's new and they join, just new, don't know anything else about the, the, uh, the company or the system or how things are run, but they have the book they can yeah. run the company smoothly. And exactly. uh, in many ways, the military is like that. So these high-pressure situations in which th the error, uh, the margin of error is quite small, mm -hmm. you want to make it dummy-proof. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was thinking, in terms of personal transformation, how can we bring this down to the level of the individual mm -hmm. and um, make it so that this is a transformative or an empowering thing 
for individuals. Um, so one of the things I was thinking was in terms of how we develop expertise. So you know that somebody is a master at something when that person knows where the exceptions lie. Mm -hmm. So um, rules of thumb, these heuristics are awesome for just going into autopilot and not ma making major mistakes. But then there are those times when you have a case at the more the, the extremes mm -hmm. where the rules of thumb break down or they mm -hmm. don't apply. And you have to know which situations those are. In order, to, in order to know that when these rules of thumb don't apply in this exceptional situation, mm -hmm. you'd have to have cultivated your intuitions. Absolutely. And it's a catch-22, <laughs> which is that to become an expert at something, you have to um, know where the rules break down, but you can't know where the rules break down unless you have yes. the experience. Yeah. <laughs> So the way to get that experience is understanding the basic rules, the, the heuristics, and mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't even have to be at a conscious level. Knowing therefore where the ex exceptions are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Um, so I mean, there's a famous example of I think it was Daniel Kahneman, or maybe it was no, Gerd Gigrins, I think, who was, was a famous researcher in, in, in sort of the heuristics field, and um, he was doing research on uh, firefighters. I believe it was. So, so he was very interested in professions that have to make decisions in high pressure environments, right? High pressure, high context environments, not where you can step back and do some calculations. And he was looking at, I think it was firemen. And there was this one case where a senior fireman was in a building and suddenly he said he just didn't feel right. And he told everyone to get out. And sure enough, it turns out that what they thought was a very safe fire actually had this huge fire. I think it was one floor below. And, and as it ended up, the whole building collapsed because the foundations were, were burning. And um, at that time, he didn't know why he felt that the whole building was unsafe. He just knew it was. And upon reflection later, he's like, oh yeah, I think it was because something about the floors were too hot or, or like there was something that was happening that was just not normal and not right. And even though he didn't consciously realize it, he'd gone through so many of these situations that he said, wait a minute, this is not normal. Um, but again, I, I think it's very important to first point out that before you worry about being a master and worrying about the edge cases, you first need to be able to be good at, you know, the, the normal stuff and very, very good at it. I remember my old basketball coach always used to say, you know, people who play in the NBA don't get to the NBA because they're really good at making really crazy fancy shots. They're there because they're really good at making layups. <laughs> Right, really good at making free throws, and they do it better than anyone else on the planet. Now, once you're in the NBA, what separates the very, very all-time greats from just you know the best are those edge cases. But you shouldn't worry about those until you're at that level. Um, I think that's one important point. I think another important point that you're talking about checklists was really good, but I, I think people need to be very careful not to misunderstand what they're say, what we're saying. Right? And in many organizations, they end up coming with these SOPs or these procedures that are very, very complex. Right? And they say, follow these 36 steps and everything will be perfect. And the truth is, in, real world, in the real world, nothing is ever perfect. And trying to expect people to follow complex procedures rarely works. And so these checklists that we're talking about in hospitals, for example, are actually not complex involved procedures. They are very, very basic, check these five things. Right? And it won't be perfect, but you'll get there 80% of the time. And in a high-pressure, high-context environment, that 80% realistically is much better than you would have got with trying to make a decision any other way in the t with the time and information that you have. And, you know, Talib, you know, we're talking last week about anti-fragility. He talks about this as well, about how when you over-optimize and you walk too close to the edge, right, and you have no margin for error, that's when you fall off the edge. And in many cases, actually taking a step back and coming and, and trying to implement an 80% solution is actually usually better because in many cases, we have no idea where the edge is anyway, exactly. And so if you just pick a good enough solution, that's what will get you there most of the time. And if anything, I would argue that masses are people who recognize that and can consistently produce the good enough 80% solution in all environments because, you know, the world is complex and the world changes, right? Amateurs can do things perfectly once. 
right? Professionals are people who can execute again and again and again. I think that's yeah, a big so difference between them. In the examples we've been using so far, it, a lot of them are where we impose or where we want to impose heuristics onto an existing system. So business, military, uh, firefighting. Um, these are all examples where there was chaos and then we want to get rid of this chaos by imposing order. Yeah. And one of the profound things about heuristics is Gigerenzer is a good example mm -hmm. of a theorist in in, it, he actually also works in philosophy. And um, at the university where I was teaching as a professor in philosophy, I led a moral psychology graduate seminar <clears throat> where we, we read some of Gigerenzer and the idea of heuristics as how human beings arrive at moral decisions. And we actually already use heuristics all the time. Yeah. We're just unthinking, uncritically mindless about them. But the human brain probably is a very good... Uh, there are very good theories on, on this, that the human brain works in modules that are related by sort of like if-then rules that work like heuristics. So <clears throat> we've often decided on the heuristics that we use for moral decision-making or, or even just general decision-making, like whether we're going to buy this box of cereal or whatever, or that brand of toothpaste, um, based on things that happened to us in our childhood. Like when we were... When we were young and we <laughs> needed a, a way to make decisions quickly mm -hmm. and often we just uncritically adopt and carry forward the old heuristics mm -hmm. and that's how we make friends for instance um, and then that's how we uh, choose um, you know an avatar in a video game I don't know whatever <laughs> these little decisions that were made when we were young we carry them over and then in adulthood we start to run into problems and we are wondering, for instance, I get, I get asked a lot, how, do, how can I learn from, and this is already an advanced question because at least he's asking how I can learn from a mistake, but how can I learn from uh, a bad relationship beyond the fact that so-and-so was a failure and like I can blame her or him for these things. What can, I what, can I, what can I learn to take forward into the next relationship or in the next dating situation so I don't make this mistake again? And... <clears throat> Because we're so uh, wedded to the unconscious, uncritical heuristics that we used before that are no longer serving us, we've lost touch with the, well, we've lost our ability to, to devise heuristics critically. And this is part of the problem with moral psychology. We make bad ethical decisions because we learned how to make decisions using heuristics when we were like six years old and we made another set of heuristics when we were eight because we got hit by a baseball walking across the field when there was a game going on. You know, like we learned these things like, okay, if there's a game going on, let's not walk across the field. Like that would be just a rule of thumb. And mm -hmm. you don't stop to think about what all the exceptions could be. What are the, ba you know, what's the logical reasoning behind this? We just, okay, I learned it through a mistake. I'm going to adopt this and move forward. And um, when we get to adulthood, we start to realize that <clears throat> those actually limit us. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's one of the profound things for me as a, as a coach for people trying to transform themselves personally, especially in relationships mm -hmm. um, and in lifestyle, to, to think more deeply about the heuristics that you're already using to mm -hmm. choose a dating partner. Or like, how are you spotting these red flags in a relationship? Or, yeah. or the, green, the green lights to go ahead. And to, to think deeper about what are the best rules of thumb for you to use, because you can't spend, you can't expend all of this brain power on lots and lots of different decisions going on in your right. life. Yeah, you know, Kahneman and, T and Tversky talk about what they call like system one, system two thinking. And humans are really bad at algorithmic thinking, right? We're actually really good at heuristical thinking. If anything, the combination of heuristical thinking plus experience is probably our one edge against the computers. That's what we do quite well. And what you should do is you should do your, your, your you know, the slow brain, so to speak, the analytic part of your brain to stop and think about what heuristics you want to put in place, right? When you have time, then that's when you can think about these things. And then you can say, okay, well, in the moment, right, in the high pressure environment, I have these heuristics and I just execute according to them. And that, that's what a lot of professionals do. They already have these heuristics, whether they realize it or not, built up, combined with experience, which is basically pattern recognition. And when, then, when you combine the two of them, you can end up with usually better outcomes than if you're trying to use algorithmic thinking in the moment. Right? 
but I, but I think that also this, this links back into, you know, we've talked in the past about principles, right? And if you believe that there are three key principles in some area that result in 80% of the outcome, actually just trying to come up with heuristics that will get you that 80% results will get most of the way there, right? And again, to combine, I guess, three different theories, right? heuristics, principles, and what we're talking about last week of resilience, it's very, very hard for anyone to predict the future. And never mind, you know, whether or not you're good at algorithmic thinking or, or anything like that, but the world, the future is uncertain and as mathematicians call it chaotic, right? It's very difficult to predict what tomorrow will look like based on today in some areas like, you know, typhoons, right? That the, the path is, is very unpredictable. And so given that the future is uncertain, right, trying to calculate the edge is impossible anyway. So you should just come up with heuristics that will get you 80% of the way there. And I mean, as I speak this, my whole building is actually swaying ever so slightly, which is designed <laughs> to do right in a typhoon, right? You Wait, need what, that resilience. You, on? you had a pretty baller 30, view when you 30, showed 30, 33rd floor. But I mean, okay, you, and you're, you, and you're you up need... in the mid-level, so you're, it's oh, on yeah. a slant. Yeah, it's, it's pretty high up. Look, but um, <laughs> you need that, right? You need some degree of fault tolerance. If I try to build the building so it's just right, you know, that, that's a really, really bad idea. Right. I want to build a building so that A, it's got enough tolerance built in that, that it's not sort of treading the edge. And I want to build some degree of resilience in so that, hey, if it need be, it just sways. No big deal, right? Because buildings that don't sway are buildings that fall over. And I think if you think of in the world in that way and you say, I can't walk too close to the edge, how do I build in heuristics that will get me 80% of the way there that are sort of help me build in that resilience to my system? Right? Almost always, especially as a human being, right, you will come up with better outcomes than if you sat down with a pen and a piece of paper and tried to work out the math, so to speak. Mm, yeah. So going back to one of the first things you said about the difference between heuristics and algorithms. Are, so we're trying to get more clarity on that distinction for, for you is, are heuristics, so would heuristics at a more advanced level be, would they become algorithmic? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, maybe, maybe the definition isn't great because, you know, I guess an algorithm is just a program set of rules. And you can argue that consciously or not, that's how our brains operate, right, at some kind of instinctual level. What I mean is, is instead of trying to sit down and, and work something out, right, so for example, to say, um, you know, let me give you another example. Um, there's one of the foundational theories in finance is this thing called modern portfolio theory that a guy called Harry Markowitz came up with and actually won a Nobel Prize for. And he outlines a way in which, given certain information, right, um, information about the future expected returns and expected variances on various asset classes, you can come up with the optimal portfolio allocation, right? Be optimal means best, right? Given this data, I can come up with the best portfolio allocation. And like I said, he won a Nobel Prize for it. And I think either shortly after he won his Nobel Prize, someone asked him, oh, like, is this actually how you construct your portfolios? You do these calculations and you allocate. And he said, oh, no, I just use a, what do you call it, one over N strategy, meaning I, I have five asset classes, I allocate evenly across the five of them, 20% each. <laughs> and so even him, who came up with this idea of how to fully optimize things, he himself did not allocate this way because he said it's just too hard to calculate. And Gigerenza, for example, has done some really interesting research to show that for you to apply modern portfolio theory, you need about 200, days worth, uh, 200 years worth of historical data. And for most asset classes, we don't have anything close to that, right? Most stock markets are not actually that old. So we just don't have enough data even to calculate how these things should look. Versus actually, if you just follow a so-called naive strategy of allocating evenly, it won't be perfect, but it will also avoid, you know, what you call like risk of ruin, right? Chances are you won't go bankrupt that way, right? Uh, I mean, again, if you look, given the way asset classes work, even if one completely blows up, chances are you'll be fine, especially over some period of time versus trying to calculate and hit the edge and probably miss it. Uh, and I think that the, these sort of naive strategies, so to speak, can be shown to work really, really well in, in many cases. So, for example, Gigerenza did some other interesting research where he showed that 
I think he walked around some town in Germany and he just plucked people off the streets, gave them a list of stocks and said, which names are you familiar with? And if you would invested in the names that people, just by pure name recognition, go, oh yeah, I've heard of that company, uh, you would have outperformed the market, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, when you think about it, it makes sense, right? Especially if it's a consumer or retail-facing company. Hey, if people on the street recognize your company name, that's a good sign, right? It's better than average. And so just really, really sort of so-called dumb heuristics like that can actually end up giving pretty good outcomes. And I guess the reason why I think that is is because humans always make decisions uh, emotionally. Now, what I mean by this is that, you know, again, you know, Kahneman, people like Kahneman talk about system one, system two, right? Almost like the two separate brains, but that's not the way it works. You know, the, there's the famous idea that uh, Descartes came up with of Cartesian duality, right? You know, I think, therefore I am. You know, many people mean that to talk about existence, but what he really means is that there is a, 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 a thinking me separate from the experiencing me, right, my body. And, uh, you know, the recent behavioral science has shown that that's just not true. You don't have your body and your mind. They are integrated. And your, your mind cannot make decisions without the body. So there's the, the, fa- the famous example of Phineas Gage. He's, an, he's a guy who had a, I think it was a railway spike through his brain. And he was perfectly normal and healthy, except for the fact that he could not, uh, he, he had no sort of emotions left. And what, um, what one researcher found is that they did this experiment where they had two decks of cards and one deck was rigged. So the idea was he was supposed to keep drawing from the two decks until he could make a decision as to which deck had more high cards than the other. And again, one deck was clearly rigged. And he was starting to draw. And the interesting thing is most people who do this, even before they consciously pick one deck and say, that is the good deck, that is the bad deck, you can measure a galvanic skin response. So they will have a, um, a primal stress response to the bad deck. Their heart rate go up, will go up, their pupils will dilate. So their, their, their body will know that that's the bad deck before their brain does. But Phineas Gage couldn't do that. I mean, he was drawing from these decks and, and, and like halfway through, it was clear that one deck was the rigged deck. And if you asked him, is that deck the rigged deck? You go, yes. And then you'll say, which deck should you choose from? And he'll say, I don't know. And so even though intellectually he was perfectly able to make these calculations, he was completely unable to make decisions. And again, later research has shown that all decisions are emotionally mediated. What I mean by that is when you have a thought in your brain, that thought has to be mediated through the brain stem. Right, amygdala and also the brain stem. And that means that how you feel, your state, as people like Tony Robbins talks about, really, really does influence almost every decision that we make. But it doesn't actually have to be the other way around. Your body, in a sense, can have reactions to things without your brain involved. So a lot of very primal, like gustatory responses, or just these sort of, you know, we call them instinctual responses to them, we have these without even conscious thought, right? Um, Spiders are one. A lot of people you see a spider before you can even consciously go, oh, that's a spider and oh, I'm scared. Your body will flinch and will react to it. Mm -hmm. And so if anything, it's the other way around. Our body makes decisions and sometimes our mind is involved. Yes. Right. But not always. Yeah. The the latest uh, neuroscience, it's not even that recent, it seems, uh, because pop culture or pop consciousness is always slow and catching up. But it's at least, the literature is at least 15, 20 years. Um, Antonio Damasio is a great figure on, on, on thinking about the brain. And the view is that the brain isn't just uh, located in that part of your skull. Through this, the spine and then through your autonomic nervous system, neuroscientists think of the brain as your entire body. Mm-hmm. And there are parts of your brain that don't enter the conscious cortexes or the frontal cortexes. And the, the processes happen, let's say, the, the brain in your gut. Mm-hmm. So there's, exactly. that's a way of talking about the, the mind-gut connection. Yeah. But there's it's, more it's, serotonin uh, in your gut than in your brain. So when people mm-hmm. talk about making gut decisions, I mean, there really is almost like a whole separate brain down there. 
right? And again, how you mm. feel, what you eat, that really does affect your decision making. Right. And then there, there are people, there's actually quite a lot of studies on people who are blind, but who can see. So blind mm -hmm. sight, where mm -hmm. they're, um, the visual stimuli is being picked up through the eyes. But because the connection to, between the eye and the frontal cortex is severed, uh, or the, well, the, the main cortex is severed, but the eye is still picking up this information, um, there's still an emotional reaction to mm -hmm. a very angry face or a very sad face. Mm -hmm. And the person, the people who are blind can't explain why they have this feeling, mm -hmm. this feeling of fear or whatever, but they have um, the bioconductance measures mm -hmm. for it. Um, so there's a lot of research, there's a lot of evidence for the fact that the brain, um, as we normally think of it, is, is a whole body thing. It's connected mm -hmm. through the, the spinal cord to the rest of the body. And we're mostly confining our view of what's happening in the brain, in the mind, so to speak, Mm -hmm. in a very small part of the brain. Exactly. Uh, and it's mostly the prefrontal cortex. <clears throat> and that's why hu and, heuristics mm -hmm. can work, right? Because you're using, in a sense, all of these information sources as opposed to just one of your information sources, which is your prefrontal cortex. Yeah. And if we had to depend on the prefrontal cortex to make decisions, we'd be royally screwed. Like you were pointing out earlier, um, our one advantage against AI, is, and this is a very scant advantage, is that because we were very slow at computing, but we are experienced over millions of years in creating heuristics, mm -hmm. mostly unconsciously, as I was explaining. And I'll give an example that everyone hopefully can understand. Driving. So <laughs> when, we, when you first drive, and if, you're, if you do it when you're young, like I did it when I was, as soon as I turned 16, took the driver's course here in Canada, and um, it was pretty freaky. Like driving around your neighborhood is pretty easy, but you get on the highway, and everything's going real fast. And if you didn't have those heuristics from the, the paper class, like the, the classroom, um, you would have to start calculating everything. So now we have driverless cars, and the computers can calculate everything, uh, hopefully. Um, so for instance, one of the heuristics I was given in driver's ed, and hopefully this still applies, <laughs> is that on the highway, you should stay three to five seconds behind the car mm -hmm. in front of you. So you know, I'll just watch the car in front of me pass one of those divider mm -hmm. paint things. And then I'll just count one steamboat, two steamboat, three steamboat. If I'm passing mm -hmm. then, I'm at a decent dis distance, depending <laughs> on my speed. Um, and if I'm going like one steamboat and I'm right behind him, okay, I'm too close. <laughs> That's it. That's all I have to think yeah. about. But if I didn't have that heuristic, I would have to calculate my speed. I have to do mm -hmm. physics. Yeah. I'd have to estimate his speed, my speed, um, how quickly my, how quick my reaction time is, how yeah. good the brakes are, all that other stuff that yeah. hopefully your driverless car computer is doing um, is super quick. And um, there are tons of other heuristics you're given in driver's ed. Mm -hmm. Because if you're required while you're driving to make calculations to decide how, what distance to stay behind the car in front of you, mm -hmm. um, you're, we're going to have a lot of accidents. And um, another heuristic that I see many people not applying is to leave like a car space in front or two car spaces in front at a red light and to be watching mostly your rear view mirror when you're at a red light. Uh, but this is just, these are just good rules of thumb and you can break, you can break from them when, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you understand why we have these rules of thumb, these uh, heuristics, but your point about heuristics have to be simple. They have to be simple for our human brains to comprehend and, and uh, enact quickly. Um, otherwise, they're going to be useless because then we might as then we're into computing land. Yeah. And um, there's a heuristic uh, that um, there's a, well, there's a movie that I saw recently again uh, called Karate Kid. Just love Karate Kid. There's so many uh, ways to use this movie. Many of you uh, listening might have watched the um, Will Smith, uh, not Will Smith, um, Jaden Smith in Jackie Chan version. I rewatched the original with Miyagi <laughs> and Daniel San. <laughs> And uh, for, for nostalgia, and I, th I think that's actually better for making these points about the Zen, the Zen approach to life, or actually the, probably the best approaches to life. And there was a scene in it where daniel San is freaking out because he's learned basically eight moves, right, by doing chores, like painting the fence and so on. And he's, it's the night before the big tournament, and um, he's freaking out because he's like, I, I'm thinking about everything I don't know. I don't, there's so much I don't know about karate. And the miyagi sans like, yes, that is right. <laughs> he says, but we have confidence not in, I can't remember the exact line, but he's something like, not in quantity of knowledge, but in quality. Hmm. And 
and then he wins the tournament. <laughs> and in many ways, it's, it's like you've, you've heard this probably before, like Bruce Lee's thing about yeah. fearing the man who's practiced the same kick a thousand times versus the man who's done a thousand moves once each. And the idea there is you have these fundamentals and they're yeah. simple and you've trained them over and over and over and they're good heuristics. Um, and uh, like, so, so in fighting, there's a, <laughs> there are a lot of heuristics. So these are just examples. Now, um, when it comes to uh, uh, emotional decisions, mm -hmm. so again, I'm bringing it back to a, a subject that I know a lot of our audience cares about, which is relationships. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are these heuristics that a lot of people didn't discover <laughs> when they were younger. Uh, and they just sort of, they never, no one taught them explicitly about social skills or about dating skills or about how to assess um, which emotions are accurate for the situation. Um, does she really like you? What heuristics do you have to determine that? And uh, I'll give an example of where there's a good heuristic that um, people can use. And uh, so a lot of the audiences are men. Here's a general, here's, a, here's an heuristic. If you meet a girl in a club, a nightclub, and she's a regular, the chances are good, this is the heuristic is, uh, don't trust her. You know, don't, don't believe anything she says. You know, take it all with a grain of salt. Mm. However, you need to know when this doesn't apply. There are exceptions. And this is where that you get into the, the edges of the, the use cases, or where the use cases break down, where, or the, the, the heuristics break down, where the, it doesn't apply to the exceptions, but you have to know where, when it applies and when it doesn't apply. So I come back to that original parad paradox. And then it links up to what you were saying about emotions. Mm -hmm. So the fact that our decisions are all emotionally laden. So here's an example um, in, from philosophy. I think this is from medieval philosophy. Burden's ass. <laughs> it's a great concept. Burden's ass is burden's donkey. So the idea is there's this donkey that doesn't feel anything, has no emotions, has no preferences. And it's, so our preferences are driven by our emotions. What do we want? And it's stuck at this fork in the road, and it's equally, it's equidistant, um, the same distance between two equally copious amounts of food. Mm. Exact same distance, exact same amount of food. And it just can't make a decision because they're equally desirable, or according to the heuristic it has. Go to the place that has more food in the quickest amount of time. So it's just looking at the food, left, right, left, right, and then it dies. <laughs> That's burden's yeah. ass. That's philosophy. And the point is that without our emotions, we wouldn't even get started. We would literally be yeah. like the AI that we have now, where there are no intrinsic desires. Um, I, don't even, like, I don't know about now, and there might be very, it might, might be pretty freaking advanced. But I mean, like before, right? So uh, where it's just literally a computer, and um, a, a lot of people don't realize how important, especially men, uh, well, people raised in a Confucian setting or, or the typical Asian culture that doesn't value emotions. In fact, wants you to get rid of emotions and, and just make decisions logically, not realizing that without the emotions attached to the preference, well, without the preferences, which are emotionally laden, which are basically, those, those actually are emotions, uh, we won't get off the ground with our decisions. And when it comes to these red flag issues or heuristics about meeting people in nightclubs. There are so many dudes who grew up with this heuristic that fun is bad, or like alcohol is evil, or like more commonly drugs are evil. And you know, this is coming off, uh, I don't know, a week or so off of Elon Musk and uh, Joe mm -hmm. Rogan's podcast, which it seems like a lot of people are talking about, in my, in my circles anyway. And I love it. And I found out later, at, we're talking to actually with Stefan Rivali about meditation, that um, there are people hating on Elon for taking a, a, a drag at the end of the uh, interview. And I, hadn't even gone, I haven't even gotten to the end of the interview yet so long, but uh, I did see the meme. And I was like, wow, that's so common. People who have a heuristic that they haven't thought about, that's uncritical. That's just this mindless thing. They heard, uh, like in the Reagan era, uh, say no to drugs or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the 1950s, it was say no to dancing. You know, so, <laughs> you know, Elvis Presley was the devil, right? And yeah, uh, there are still a yeah, lot of colleges that. that banned dancing and alcohol um, back in the 50s. 
And uh, that, was a, that was a heuristic that was uncritically adopted. And like I was saying, most people adopt these heuristics uncritically mm -hmm. from outside sources and or from when they were young. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to meeting people in nightclubs, generally, yeah, it, a good heuristic is don't trust people that you meet in nightclubs because of the type of personality that would be, um, that would, that, that would, that kind of environment would attract. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of exceptions. I used to go to nightclubs <laughs> a lot. I like to think that I was an exception. Um, and, and I know plenty of other exceptions, but they're still the minority. And it's, it's important to, to know why that heuristic is in place so that you know when to break from it and which, uh, which times are exceptions. And once you start to develop that expertise, uh, then you, be, you start to develop this sort of mastery. Um, so in, in martial arts, you know, like it, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a great example. There's a guy you should, everyone should follow who's interested in strategy, John Danaher. He was his yes. BJJ coach. And he const he's every day posting these long, long form Instagram essays, basically. Uh, and a lot of them are about where the, uh, where the heuristics break down. Because at that, that more advanced level, that's, where you're deal that's what you're dealing with. Because everyone, by the time you get to an intermediate or whatever the belt level would be, knows the general heuristics. Right? The guy's going to go into a Kimura, their counterattack is this. Then, so you're, it's like chess. You're already thinking really far yeah. ahead. And then you start to get into semi-algorithmic thinking where the heuristics get more and more complex. But they're still heuristics for the expert practitioner. Because uh, they're still simple for the expert practitioner. But they got there by practicing the basic heuristics. And then we have to develop a heuristic to figure out what heuristics to adopt at the beginning. And this is where we get the cognitive bias towards authority. And this is a useful one. This is one that's ingrained in us probably in our DNA, because uh, it was evolutionarily adaptive to, to look towards authority. So you don't have to create, uh, reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, one thing you can do is to look for people who have done the thing that you're trying to do and what heuristics do they adopt. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about heuristics on this podcast. Yep. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, uh, I think learning, right? How to learn, right? The art of learning. Those are some of the most powerful heuristics because that's the, the root one which helps you learn others. And I, th I think it's the really interesting thing is that that's exactly what AI researchers are doing these days, right? Trying to teach the AI how to learn. And, um, you know, talking earlier about um, AI trying to be algorithmic, actually, a lot of the cutting edge uh, ways in which people are designing things like self-driving cars are to try and mimic human decision making more and more. So, you know, there's a big difference between the way that Tesla and Google have been developing their self-driving cars. So Google's idea in a typical Google fashion was put tons and tons of sensors on the car and we will try and write better and better algorithms to teach the car how to compute data and make decisions and drive itself been semi-successful, right? They still haven't launched any kind of working product. Tesla, on the other hand, for better or for worse, has launched some kind of working product. And their approach is very, very different. For about two years before they even told anybody that they were rolling out this kind of functionality, they already put a bunch of sensors on cars. No one near as advanced, no cameras. They were just sort of lasers, pretty cheap, collecting, uh, but collecting reams and reams of data. So for two years, all of these Tesla drivers all around the world were driving and uh, they were gathering data on how these cars are driving and basically teaching their, their machines as to how to actually operate. So rather than try and program, okay, what should, uh, what should we do in this situation at this intersection? They just said, what has the last thousand drivers done at this intersection? And if you know, 999 out of them all do the same thing, that's probably a good starting point, right? And, and a lot of machine learning is really built this way, either by observation, right? How do other people do it? And you can feed in, for example, when you're playing, you know, trying to teach someone to play a video game, I mean, teach an uh, AI to play a video game, you upload all of the games of all of the best players in the world, and it, tr it studies that, it models how these players do it, or it just does trial and error. And in a sense, it models itself. It keeps trying and trying and trying thousands of times. And then it figures out what are the optimal strategies to take. Rather than trying to calculate in, in some way, again, algorithmically, it just copies, it models. 
and some of the more advanced, um, I, I guess you could call it AI you see these days, like AlphaGo, for example, uh, the, the, the famous Google DeepMind algorithm that, that played and beat sort of the, the world Go champion, was based on a combination of algorithms, trying to figure out the roles and make calculations, and heuristical analysis, uh, right? trying to copy how humans think, how humans make these kind of decisions, and how to sort of figure out the 80% solution when one line of thinking is no longer optimal and chances are I should be applying all my computing power along this line. So I guess the scary thing is that AI is very rapidly trying to copy some of this heuristical-based thinking. And that is why recent AI has gotten so much better so quickly, right? Applying computing power plus the heuristical analysis. Wow, that's fascinating. I didn't know that about the, the Google um, Tesla issue. That's so cool. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, yeah. In uh, individual or personal psychology, you, you've heard of this distinction between the maximizer and the satisficer. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of guys who have trouble with women and attraction because they're too uptight, because their temperament veers towards the maximizer. So he wants to make the best decision, and he will take a ton of time to do so because it, it matters that much because it's actually a fear-based type of temperament and, or de and decision-making style. So I'll give an example. Um, if I have an event and the, the maximizers will usually sign up way in advance. And no matter when I announce it, they'll sign up then. So if I announce it two weeks ahead, they'll sign up two weeks ahead and be pissed. If I announce it four months ahead, they'll sign up at the four-month mark. <laughs> and they'll feel better about it because now they can get the, the best flight for the best price and get the best hotel room, the best value, and they're booking way ahead. And there's a lot of anxiety there if they're not able to do that. And then I get emails because often, you know, to actually an attractive trait is being easygoing and taking it easy and realizing... Uh, it's, most things in life aren't, aren't, aren't going to make that much of a difference if you make a decision um, early on or not. <clears throat> and to be happy with good enough. And uh, that's the satisficer position, which is like that 80%, 90%. Um, obviously, there's a continuum there. And there are, have been studies that show that uh, maximizers yeah. make marginally better decisions when you... Uh, lengthen that amount of time they have to make the best decision. But their satisfaction with that marginally better decision is equal or is often lower than the satisficers who make a slightly less mar uh, optimal decision, but they do it quickly and they move on with their lives and they're pretty happy with, uh, more, more happy, more satisfied with the decision uh, because they have a, an heuristic. The heuristic is good enough is good enough. And then they move on. Mm -hmm. So speed. Um, so you can see how when it comes to making decisions like in driving or, um, or playing chess or something, um, that sometimes if you can just get to these simple heuristics, you get the benefit of speed uh, and then you learn quicker along the way. Everything just speeds up so much faster uh, in terms of your, also in terms of your learning uh, and your learning curve. And along the way, you have these people who lose. They might win in the short term because maybe when you're in the fourth grade, you're not penalized for taking a lot of time to do something. But over time, especially as you're an, when you're an adult, waiting to this, to, for the, just the perfect time to go talk to the girl at the bar, that means you'll never talk to that girl mm -hmm. at the bar. Or you'll never talk to the girl at the Starbucks walking by or whatever. Yeah. Because you, there's never the maximum or the optimal perfect time to go. <clears throat> and in, yep. rarely in life is there ever the perfect anything. And a good heuristic is good enough and move. Good enough and go. And uh, it's no wonder that that's actually an adaptive trait, that females would have selected males out for that. Um, there's also this uh, risk-taking element there uh, versus the maximizer. Uh, but there's also just a lot more room for enjoyment of life. Yeah. I mean, I, I was in uh, San Diego at uh, Coronado in the, the U.S. Navy SEAL training base a while ago. And I was listening to one of the, the Navy SEAL commanders talk. And he was saying that, you know, if you wait until you have the 100% perfect solution, you're too late, right? Once you get the 80% solution, you go. And you're saying, actually, in today's world, once you get the 60% solution, you should already go. Yeah, absolutely. I think my, my video is frozen. Oh. Is you, 
It might be mine. It might be my internet slowly dying. As it the might be the storm. Ever roll in because it is getting <laughs> so stronger. So this is probably a good time to wrap up. I think yeah. we've uh, covered a lot of ground here. We're way over time. Yeah. And uh, hopefully you can batten down the hatches there. Yeah. And, well, maybe uh, before we end, I just want to. I you know you're talking about kung fu and training earlier, and uh, I, it reminded me of this old quote, and I read it out quickly before we end. And it's got this old master, and he says, "Why?" Oh, so this this young uh, disciple who's talking to the master, and he says. Uh, why am I not advancing in my technique, master? And the guy says, have you seen the sunset when the seagulls fly flaming across the plain? He says, yes, master. And the guy says, and the water from the waterfall hitting the rock without achieving anything? And he says, yes, master. He says, and the moon reflecting upon calm water? And he says, yes, master. The guy says, that's your problem. You keep watching stupid shit instead of practicing. (laughs) Oh, that's perfect. (laughs) Yep. All right, so yeah, that's a, a perfect ending. Thank you for the quote, uh, uh, Henry. And uh, mm-hmm. let's uh, let's wrap this up. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, Henry, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, you can find me on my website at henrychong.com. I should have links to everything else there. Awesome. And you can find me at davidtnphd.com. We'll put everything in the show notes for the links out. And uh, thanks so much again for listening. We will be back again shortly. And hopefully Henry will be all in one piece, as will Hong Kong. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, it's David again. Before you go, a couple last things. First, all the show notes and links to resources can be found at davidtnphd.com backslash dtphdpodcast. Or you can just go to davidtnphd.com and find it through the top navigation menu. Second, if you'd like to interact with me or other like-minded fans of the podcast, then join our private DTPHD podcast Facebook group. We've got an awesome community of intelligent, wise individuals from literally all around the world. You can send a join request to the group using the link you'll find in the show notes of every podcast at davidtnphd.com backslash DTPHD podcast. Click the link, log into your Facebook, and then click to join. We approve join requests every day. So go to davidtmphd.com and click the link to join. See you inside our group.